evening, everybody. Good evening. It is me, Dr. Renee, and we are back again. Blackdoctor.org, of course. Um, so in case you guys hadn't noticed, today is February 10th, 2022. And so February, besides the fact that Valentine's Day is next week, but February is known as Heart Month. Um, last Friday was Go Red Day. So today we're going to talk about the heart. And uh, I'm really excited because we're not talking about, we're, we're going to cover a few things in the heart. Um, my guest has a very, very, very special story and um, the way that she's helping people with their heart health. And I know she could help many of you. So right now I need you to, one, type in the comments and tell me where you're watching us from. And two, I need you to share. So we're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. Um, please, please, please share, 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 because I know for a fact that you know somebody who has high blood pressure or diabetes or they are somebody who um, has some other heart ailment. And so I need you to please let them know to watch because we are trying to save lives today. And um, I hope that you, I know you're gonna get something from this. So please tune in. We're gonna get right into it because you know I don't wait. Good evening, Dr. Toomer. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate your time. And I know that you are going to touch somebody tonight because when I read your story, I thought it was pretty, pretty interesting. And I'm so glad that you're still with us. Praise the Lord. So can you please tell us your heart story? Well, um, when I was 36 years old, which was 20 years ago, um, over the years, and I'll just give a little backstory. Um, I had... Uh, was never a small person, never thin really, but I just slowly gained weight over years and years and years. Most of it stress weight from school, from med school, from residency, from marriage and all the rest. And had one comment. baby. <laughs> 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 and then and then I had a baby and never lost that weight, that baby weight. And then I had my second child within three years of my first. And uh, at that point, I was morbidly obese. My BMI was over 41, which, you know, again, we'll talk a little bit about how BMI is not yeah. really a good measure for us, especially. But, um, but it just kind of gives an idea of where I was. I was over 200 pounds and I'm only five feet tall. And so, um, and then a month after my daughter was born, I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure related to the pregnancy. It's very rare. There's a high mortality rate with the diagnosis. I knew this because I had actually lost a patient to the same diagnosis when I was a resident. And so I was terrified and very overwhelmed. I was tired just from my diagnosis. I could barely move. I could barely breathe. And um, I didn't know what to do. So wait, and, wait, wait. So let me stop you there. So you had right. a baby and then were diagnosed with congestive heart failure. Yes. So, um, first of all, you have a newborn. So I know and a human beings that have babies that are mm -hmm. beyond overwhelmed and, yes. you know, can't get any. So you have this diagnosis on top of having to take care of a new baby. Yes. And a toddler. Oh, and who, I forgot. And you had another yeah, one. I had a there. two and a half year old who uh, was very active and always asking questions. Mommy, why can't you do this? I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't walk and hold my baby at the same time. Oh my I had to choose which one wow. I was going to do. So um, if I needed to, if she started to cry, I could not jump up out of bed, walk to her and then pick her up because I would be too winded and out of breath. Oh and my so, goodness. Yeah. So wait, I couldn't, so let yeah. me just ask this question. Were you somebody mm -hmm. that, because I have spoken very openly about my weight loss on here and I've said mm -hmm. how... I literally, and I don't know if I even told you this, but I literally couldn't walk to the bathroom in my 640 square foot apartment without mm -hmm. my back hurting. And mm -hmm. that is one of the things that stopped me in my tracks was like, you gotta do better. I only lived on the fourth floor of my high rise. My high rise has 19 floors. Mm -hmm. I only lived on the fourth floor. So even the times when the elevator was out, it wasn't like I was climbing, you know, 10 flights or anything. But mm -hmm. those four, especially on top of the fact that I have asthma, were no joke. Yeah. Um, now it's nothing, thank God, mm -hmm. but it was awful. But yeah. I cannot imagine not being able to pick up your child and you heard mm -hmm. them cry. You get to them and you yeah. just. 
Yeah. Congestive heart failure causes such shortness of breath, especially mine was very severe. Um, at the time, I, at the first month, I didn't even realize that's what it was. I kept saying, you know, telling my doctors, I'm, I'm really short of breath. This is a little bit more than usual. I'm a little bit more swollen than usual. And then I, I, I did eventually go see someone and I was diagnosed with pneumonia. Um, oh. Yeah, because I had a fever. However, with congestive heart failure, with postpartum cardiomyopathy, endocarditis, which is the inflammation and infection of the lining of the heart, can also happen at the same time. And that causes a fever. So the fever sort of threw everybody off and thought, you know, you can't breathe, your lungs sound horrible, and you have a fever, it's pneumonia. But I couldn't, still couldn't do anything. Um, and, but I was just terrified. I mean, it was to the point I couldn't lie down and sleep. I had to sleep sitting up. Mm-hmm. Um, I kept, I, I would fall asleep scared, wondering if I was going to wake back up. Um, wow. I, I did not think I was going to survive it. Uh, now, even knowing the, I mean, it was, so you said you were, you know, a heavier person, but did you, cause in residency, I will never forget one, we're short people. Mm-hmm. I'm 411. I mean, I remember trying to keep up with the doctors when I was a med student. I was like, dear God, it, you know, one of their strides mm-hmm. is like 10 of mine. So I was like, yeah. so were you able to keep up then? Like, did you ever experience mm-hmm. shortness of breath of li- like this then? Um, I only experienced a little bit of shortness of breath like that when I was pregnant with my daughter. I was in my third year of residency when I had my first daughter. Okay. And so um, then I, I did did feel it, but I would just don't slow down. <laughs> I was a senior resident at that point. I was like, look, <laughs> you know, uh, I was like, I'm, I'm about to, I'm going to start referring to patients right now. So you got to be nice to me. Right. <laughs> right, know, right. So. <laughs> but, um, but at that time, um, you know, I knew that my weight was giving my heart just too much to do. And I was finally diagnosed. Um, and the way I was diagnosed, I was actually, uh, my husband was out of town. My, I was at my, my in-laws who lived a few miles away and I couldn't use the bathroom. I couldn't produce enough pressure to urinate because I, my, I could not, you don't realize how much you use your lungs until you just can't use them. I t- That's how I short that breath about I a lot was. Of things. I, I mm-hmm. had, um, I had something wrong with my foot, my big toe. Yeah. And I couldn't step on it. And I said, you don't know how much you need it until you. Until it, until it's gone. Exactly. And so that's when I, I woke them up. It was in the middle of the night. I woke them up. We got an ambulance. They got me to the hospital. And um, at that point, they took an x-ray and my lungs were just completely whited out. I was still breastfeeding. Had never used formula. My first daughter breastfed until she stopped. Had never used formula, never drank milk, never used a bottle. So I didn't even have bottles for my daughter. Oh God! And, and suddenly, now you're a patient in the hospital. In the hospital, I was. And your husband's on vacation. I mean, your husband's out of town. He was away because he was out of town uh, preparing for his radiology boards, and so I I was in the hospital, unable to breathe, breastfeeding my daughter because we didn't have formula for her. While they're doing the test, they had to hold her while they did the X-ray. Brought her oh back God. to me like a birth circuit, and I and I'm crying. Because I'm just scared and I'm, my, my oxygen level was so low, so my brain wasn't functioning properly. And so I was just terrified. Um, she was screaming and then they took, would take her and they she'd start screaming and they're like, they're trying to give her form. It was just, you know, my husband was gone. So we were trying to get a hold of him. Right. You know, fortunately, it was in a hospital where I had privileges, so people knew me. So I had a lot of support of people who were there. But, um, I, I did not think I was gonna I was going to live. I knew enough. I could they put the x-ray up in front of me and when I looked at it, I was like, that's it. I'm not surviving this. Um, wow, that is crazy. And so then when they did the echocardiogram to just see exactly how my how much my heart was working, my ejection fraction was fifteen percent. And so for anyone tell everyone who knows, what exactly that means. Usually okay, so ejection fraction is pretty much your heart pumps blood. It fills, then pumps, then fills, then pumps. Generally, when your heart fills with blood and it pumps, it usually pumps out about 55 to 65% of what it fills. And so it's called the ejection fraction. Mine was at 15, so my heart was filling, but only 15% of what it was filling with was coming out. And so that's why it's called congestive heart failure, because my heart was failing 
and that liquid was congesting my lungs. It's going into my lungs, and then it goes into your liver, mm -hmm. and that causes another set of problems. Um, and so, and I knew all this. I couldn't turn my brain off, of but I couldn't use my brain to help myself. It was just a bad situation. And so, um, and then they had to give me medicine that I couldn't breastfeed. So I had, to, and so we, and we didn't have formula. We didn't even know she would take up. She wouldn't take a bottle. So, and I didn't have a pump. I didn't have anything. I mean, was, she was only a month out I, and I was on maternity leave. So I didn't even, I had two more months before I had to start pumping and putting stuff away, you know? And so, um, and so it was a mess. It was just an absolute mess. So she had to be in the room with me, even though I couldn't feed her. They had to keep her with me just so I could soothe her because she would just cry, and cry, and cry. They couldn't yeah. take her to the nursery. My husband wasn't there. My in-laws were my were with my toddler. Right. I was like, they they need no. to take care of the other one. So, um, and so, and she's wondering, you know, where's my baby sister? Because as far as she was concerned, that was her baby, not mine. <laughs> so she was like, "Why are you taking my sister. baby in an ambulance?" <laughs> Right. I have a little sister. I understand. Yes. And so it was, um, but when I got out, I knew enough to know that anyone with heart disease, there's a very much a connection between heart disease and depression. In fact, um, I was always trained that if someone has heart disease, if they're diagnosed, you automatically start treating for depression, either with medication, counseling, or both. And so, but, but the problem with depression is that it zaps you of motivation. And so all the things I knew I had to do to get better, I was so depressed. I had postpartum depression. I had diagnosis depression. I had cardiac depression. And I already had, I was still recovering from residency. So I had mild chronic depression because I was right. only a year out of residency. And I, I, just, I shut you down. You were just completely paralyzed. Like, I just I completely just can't shut do down. And so... Um, so what I did is I, I decided, okay, well, I'll get help from someone else. I'll have them help me lose weight. And, I'll ha and I was an insulin-dependent diabetic at the time. I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Is everyone listening? <laughs> <laughs> I was on insulin and a and diabetic. And wait, you were type 2 then, right? Yes. Okay. It, was from, it was a combination of my obesity. It started with my obesity and then exacerbated by the pregnancy. Got it. And so because of the pregnancy, I was on insulin because usually that's the only medication you can take for diabetes when pregnant. Right. So I hadn't yet gotten off it to go on to something else. And so when I tried to get my diabetes under control, I went to the endocrinologist. They're like, You're, we're not touching you. You stay on your insulin until your heart gets better. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, well, then let me try to lose weight. So I went to some of the more popular programs. And they're like, you're too high risk. We're not, we're not touching you. And I thought, wait a minute. How can your program be so unhealthy that you can't help me because I'm high risk? That doesn't wait, make so, sense. So let me ask, because I honestly have never called any of these places. Um, mm -hmm. So medical weight loss, isn't there a physician that's in charge of those things? Okay. So that was my point because I, I didn't know. That's why I was like, let me ask. Because I know yeah. I, I currently, it's no secret, I do Weight Watchers. I know Weight Watchers has nothing to do with medicine and does, I mean, mm -hmm. not medically, you know, it doesn't But to be honest, Weight Watchers turned me, my, my local Weight Watchers turned me away also. Okay. Okay. Because they're just like, you know. Well, that's what I'm saying. They, But that's yeah. why I was saying medical weight loss. I always yeah. felt like that's the place I should call. Yes. Because... Exactly. Well, you have to also understand this was 20 years ago. A lot right. of things have changed in a lot of these places. Right. Even Weight Watchers has changed a lot it's, um, it's given what they but, do. Yeah. And so what happened, so then I, I, of course, was already depressed and, you know, getting worse because I was then hopeless, helpless. And I was just, you, know, you can't find anyone to help you overwhelmed. And then I was like, you know what, Catherine, get it together. You're a doctor. You can do this. You've helped so many of your patients through this. You can get yourself through it. And I thought, you know, what is I was trained in a, what's called a biopsychosocial system. So I'm like, you know what to do. Focus on your biology. Focus on your psychology. Focus on the sociology of all of this. You know what to do. And I and I said, what's your number one issue? Because I'm looking at my baby and I just couldn't bring myself to do anything. And I was like, if your babies can't get you motivated, 
what is the true issue? And I was like, it was my depression. And so I was like, treat your depression first. Let's get your depression under control. And then let's see what happens. And as soon as I did that, it just so happened that my favorite antidepressant that I've used with all of my patients at that time was just an antidepressant. Now it's actually used in a weight loss medication. And the reason I chose it is because it acts quickly. There are few side effects. There's no withdrawal if you stop it. And so whereas many um, antidepressants take four to six weeks to get started, this one starts working immediately. So I'm like, I need something now. Um, I was so afraid of getting worse right. because, you know, postpartum depression can is a, can really mess with your head even more than regular depression. Right. And it could turn uh, into psychosis. Know. And that's yeah. what we've heard of these people. Exactly. You know, there They'd was a be woman in Chicago that me. jumped out of a hotel building, you know. Well, a month before my daughter was born, someone in Charleston, South Carolina, where I, um, near where I live, did the same. A physician. Mm. She was a physician and she postpartum depression. So I was scared. I was just like, you know, you might go down that path if we don't get this under control because I was already having thoughts that they'd be better off without me. Not only am I depressed, I'm sick. I can't do anything. My husband had to help me bathe. He had to do all the cooking. He couldn't, everyone else had to take care of my baby because I couldn't do it, you know? And, and, and my whole identity around motherhood, especially at that time, you know, at that stage was breastfeeding and I couldn't right. do it. And so I, um, but I was like, if it, so I just basically chose an antidepressant that I couldn't even actually get my doctor to prescribe. So I actually prescribed it for myself. Fortunately, it's legal. So I was able to do that. And so I prescribed it, started taking it, and immediately started getting better. Suddenly, my outlook changed. My mindset shifted. Of course, now we know mindsets are very much of a part of, of, getting, of wellness. Then nobody was talking about mindset. And so took my antidepressant, started getting motivated, and then started creating my own program. I would... I said, okay, I'm going to get my diabetes under control. One of the beautiful things about diabetes is that it's, it is meal related. Mm -hmm. It takes one meal to get your diabetes under control. And so have, not being able to cook, and my husband was like, we're getting you well. <laughs> so he did the cooking. And so I started paying attention. How much could I eat? You know, what could I eat? Because I'm not, one of the things I learned very quickly, I don't have a lot of willpower and discipline around food. I just don't. I no, like my food. You know, I always tell everyone, you got to know you. Mm -hmm. And if and you, I like you don't know you, then that, that's a problem. You need to know what works for you and what does not work for you. Exactly. I know there's certain things I'm not going to say no to. And there's yep. certain things that I can say, well, I don't like you could bring 10 cakes in front of me right now. And I promise you, I would not take a slice of any of them. Mm -hmm. But yeah. other people, that would be a problem for them. But that's not a problem mm -hmm. for me. But yeah. then if you put you know, the best snickerdoodles on the planet in front of me. I am a cookie monster. I'm going to eat cookies. That's me. Oreos. Well, actually, it's anything sweet. I have a sweet tooth. That's and I don't I have a sweet do. tooth. So I I'm do. very particular. It has to be mm -hmm. certain things. Like I, you certain can put things. all the candy in the world and I'm not going to touch it. But, yeah. you know, certain things. So you have to. That's good that you knew. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm one of those people. I'll, I, I like everything except what I'm allergic to. So. And even the things I'm allergic to, I still look at people eating it thinking, man, I wish I could eat that. <laughs> I okay, love food. All the I just like I'm food. allergic to because I've never had them. I have no, like, I don't. Well, I haven't had them either. I just like the way they smell. I like the way they look. They just look like something that's like, I've never, I can't I can't shrimp. have chocolate and I've never eaten it, but I've never yeah. sat there and been like, no, it's never. Well, see, I'm allergic to seafood. I am too. So, and so I see people eating shrimp and I see people eating Maybe fish. Maybe the way it looks, it never, it did not, it doesn't. Appear. It smells good to me anyway. So what would happen though, is that I learned that very quickly. So what I started doing was saying, you know, the only thing that gave me pleasure, the only thing that made me feel good was sitting down with my family and eating. So I'm like, I'm not going to stop doing this. So I started documenting my blood sugars after eating certain things. And I just kept really meticulous records of what made my blood sugar go up, what didn't. When it made my blood sugar go up, I was like, well, maybe if I just reduce a little bit of this and increase a little bit of that, maybe it will work. It started to work. And so I documented that. 
And within six months, I had lost 60 pounds. And suddenly I was off, I was off insulin at that point because my blood sugars were normalized. The beautiful thing about diabetes control is that when it's more controlled, your weight comes down. And when your weight comes down, your diabetes becomes more controlled. So it was a nice cycle of improvement for me. And high blood sugars also affected moods. So when my blood sugar started coming down, my depression started coming down as well. And so it was just this nice combination, this nice stew of events that just got me feeling better. And I was then able to focus on my heart and getting better from that. And when I started cardiac rehab at that time, I couldn't walk on a treadmill for a minute. Mm. I had to stop because my heart rate would jump up too high. Within a year, I was able to walk 10 minutes. Even though my weight had come down, I was still feeling the effects of the medicate of the uh, congestive heart failure. A year ago, I'm 56 years old now. I'll be 57 in August. August I walked by for August 26th. You're a Virgo too. We have a lot. Yeah. I'm August 26th. <laughs> so I, I, but anyway, I, I, I went I went through cardiac rehab uh, again recently. I do that every couple of years just to kind of keep me doing well, but I was easily walking four or five miles a day, not even thinking about it. Awesome. And I was told I had five, I had a 50% chance of living five years. And I'm here now 20 years later. And I know my weight loss saved my life. I know okay. it. It just did. Now your but heart, what, is, is, what are they saying about your heart now? Well, it's, it's, I still have congestive heart failure. I still have it. Uh, but because two things, my attitude keeps me well. My cardiologist has always said, you'll know you're well when you forget. And I forget all the time. I'll run up a flight of stairs and I'm even thinking about it. I'm like, whew, I'm a little winded. I'm like, what? Oh, because <laughs> you just ran upstairs and you got congestive heart failure, girl. <laughs> you know, that's why. <laughs> but, you know, I forget. Or I'll pick up something really heavy. You know, I'll do so. And I just, I just live normally. And unless something stops me in my tracks, I, I just do what I do. And so, um, but my, my attitude and my weight loss, mm -hmm. I'm right now, um, even though, I mean, weight is important, but I, I, right now I am um, about three to four pounds away from where I was in high school. And as a result of that, I don't, my body just doesn't, my heart doesn't have to work as much. Right. My joints don't have to work as much. Um, you know, I, I still eat food. I love food and I eat it. I just am very careful about how I eat it, but I don't deny myself anything because food's too much of a joy. I like it. I mean, that's, that's one of my joys of life. So I continue that's what to do I tell that. everyone, like I was like, you know, I've, you know? I've seen all of these and heard all these, these elimination yeah. diets. And I was like, you know, mm -mm. funny, I eat everything I want to eat. Yesterday was national mm -hmm. pizza day. I don't know if everyone knew, but we had pizza over no. here okay. and it was delicious. And no, I yeah. didn't have cauliflower crust pizza. I had, no. Jets, I had a piece of Jets cheese pizza and it was delicious yeah. <laughs> because I eat what I want to eat. Now I tell people yeah. that I work out so I can eat what I want to eat, but yes. And not only that, but the way you you feel, the how you eat and the way you eat and what you're feeling when you eat changes what your body does with food. If you you're know, eating I out of guilt, watched um, I forgot what it was, something, and it was a whole thing about how you're supposed to have a certain mindset when you put the food you're in your eating. mouth. And stuff. Yes. And of course, at the time I was really fat and I was just like, oh my God, this has got to be some craziness. But I was no. desperate. I was like, I need to try everything I can. But I think that, um, it's funny you say that because I weigh myself mm -hmm. every single day and mm -hmm. I always think, you know, I used to think, Oh, well, I had, you know, KFC yesterday. And when I get on the scale in the morning, oh my God. But it's never yeah. like that. <laughs> Just well, like and that. then also, and then even if it is, usually it's the salt, not the food. So, right. you know, and, you and know, that's I something. I a gallon of water a day. Water so, a day. Eat, so that's, and then, that, well, that's I. All right on out. Yeah, well, see, for me, one, I couldn't, I can't, I couldn't exercise at the time I was losing my weight right. because of my heart. And I couldn't drink a lot of water either because mm -hmm. of my heart. One of the, one of the, um, uh, recommendations when you have congestive heart failure is to limit your water intake because your heart 
can't pump that volume. You have blood volume, so you have to reduce it. So all those things came into play, but I realized for me, it was simply getting my blood sugars under control and that's what did it. And realizing that I could. Um, the biggest hurdle for me was just fear that I was going to fail. I was like, yes, this is working, but when it, if, what it happens if it stops? What am I going to do then? And so, but it just didn't stop and it kept going. And I was you know, I think that somewhere along the line, I somewhere in 2021, I was like, this is a fluke. Like, this is kind of weird because I haven't mm -hmm. been this small in more years than I can count. I have my um, annual exam on the 22nd mm -hmm. of February. And if I play my cards right, I will be less than I weighed when I came into my OBGYN's office, into her practice when I was 17 years old, the week before mm -hmm. I started Michigan State. Oh, wow. And it's yeah. And so, and this is doctor. what it is. Yes. Yeah, so and so what happened in that's high school, basically. So yeah. I am just like, it, it blew me away. Cause I just was like the scale. I always say numbers don't lie. So I was just like, is the scale for real? And because yeah. I haven't seen people in person because of this lovely pandemic, I just see my family who sees me daily, but they were like, but you didn't notice. I go, I guess I did it. And like today I looked yeah. in the mirror and was like, oh my God. Like I like have mm -hmm. no rolls in my back. I was like, what yeah. is this? You know, I well, you know, with, with, it's it's the, it, with that like, psychology. But you know, for some people, that's their pitfall though. Um, you, you, one of the things that I do, because I, well, this is to carry on my story. Um, so what happened when I finally was able to go back into medicine, I realized that when I had my, because I'm a family medicine physician. Um, and so, what I realized was that I couldn't help my patients in the same way that I helped myself because I wasn't given time. I wasn't given the resources. And most of the places I worked were not, were not inclined to provide what was necessary for me to do that because it takes a lot of time. And so, and I worked with underserved populations because that was my calling and it is my calling still. And so when I realized that I was just baiting my head against a wall, and the stress of the jaw of that was actually making my heart deteriorate. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to kill myself over work. So I, what I ended up doing was just creating something for myself where I founded health, wellness, and weight loss centers where I could spend an hour with people. I could actually go through all of their bi biology, their psychology, and their sociology. I screened for everything. And so it, it, I was very adamant that whatever people did, it did not affect their family life. It didn't affect their marriage. It didn't affect their work life. It didn't affect their friendships because there's nothing sadder than sitting with your friends and they're all eating something. And you're sitting you there like, I'm on a diet. I can't eat that. Or even worse, you don't even go out with them because you're sitting at home because you're like, I don't even want to be tempted. I don't want to go out because I can't eat what they're eating. I can't. And I just so... The, the, so what I just, I did was I just like, you know, you cannot do that. And so I fit, I created a program that fit into my life. And so essentially what I do now is just help people take it and fit it into theirs. Did you because... all hear that? So if you need some help, one, we are at blackdoctor.org. She is looking to help people like us. Here's her website. I put it up on the screen. Oh, and you. if your doctor because a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of us that are, oh, I don't want to take medicine. Oh, I don't want to take pills. But you guys realize that you do need this medication or else you need to do something else. Mm -hmm. And a lot yeah. of people, one, they wait too late. You know, there's a whole lot of us walking around with pre-diabetes. Um, or diagnosis, insulin resistance and don't even know it. Don't have a clue or the doctor told you, but you didn't change anything. The next mm -hmm. time you go, they are going to be forced to put you on something. Yes. So you have got to nip it in the bud now. You know, there's a mm -hmm. lot of people don't want to take blood. They don't want to take a water pill because I'm only mm -hmm. 35. Why am I taking water pills? Because your BMI is 30 something, 40 something. Mm -hmm. And you about to have a stroke and die. You need to take a water pill. Yeah. So it is important that we nip it in the bud now. And like mm -hmm. she said, she sits down with you. She takes all of your, you know, all the blood work to get it all together to figure out exactly what is your story because your numbers no. will not lie. No. So what is and we're going to talk about that too. But one of the things that's wonderful is that because of COVID, this is one of the best things to come out of COVID. Everything could be done electronically now. Yep. So one yep. of the beautiful things is I closed my office. 
I closed my office because of COVID, but now I can help everyone, people around the world. And so I do. I mean, I have people I, that I uh, work with in many, many different countries. And so, but what's really important to understand is that nobody's trying to kill you. They're trying to save your life. Right. And medication won't kill you, but not taking it can. And, and so if someone recommends it, it's not because they're trying to sell you something. We don't get anything from the pharmaceutical companies, no matter what anybody says, we don't get anything from them for sure prescribing not. medications. We just don't. And so what we are doing is trying to prevent you from having to take more medication later because it's easier to prevent say, when you change your diet, it mm -hmm. costs a lot of money to eat healthy. No, it costs more money mm -hmm. to be sick. And it doesn't cost a lot of money to eat healthy anyway. No, I, I can take $5 to the dollar store and, and have enough meal for a, four, for, for a family for three days because a bag of beans, a bag of rice, Cans of, of vegetables do not cost a whole lot of money. And that's enough to make you, that's a healthy meal. There's a reason why beans and rice, beans and corn are combinations that you see around the world. The, the poorest people of the world eat mostly vegetables, eat a healthier diet than we do. And, and they don't have much. They don't so, have much. no, they don't have, it's, it's really not difficult. And that's the other thing, but that part, that's part of the social part. When people say, well, I don't have the money, I can't do this, I can't do that. We figure it out because that's part of what you have to do. You have to take care of the whole person. It can't just be one part. It has to be all of them and everything that they deal with. And so when people tell me, say, you know, you're a weight loss doctor and I'm like, yes and no, you know, I'm like, I, I help people lose weight, but that weight can be in pounds or whatever in life is weighing them down. I help them lose both. And really for health, it's not about the numbers on a scale necessarily okay, as it is the amount of fat. Reason. Oh, I am. am I echoing now? Okay. You're okay now. Go ahead. Okay. So one of the things that I say is that not all weight loss is good weight loss. So it's really fat loss that we're looking for because you can lose muscle while you lose weight and we don't want people to lose muscle. And the reason why so many, you'll see that someone will lose weight and they can't keep it off and it comes right back is because they lost too much, much muscle during that process and they didn't do it in a way so that they maintain their muscle mass. And so, um, so that's why weight is sort of, you know, we use the word weight because people understand what that word is, but really what you're trying to do is lose fat because fat in your body causes inflammation and you know, it's not about body shaming. Um, it really isn't. And we should be healthy at any size. doesn't matter what your size is. Because it's not about size. It's not about a number. It's about your health. And so if your numbers look good, if your blood pressure looks good, your blood sugars look good, and, and you know, your, your um, thyroid's functioning like it's supposed to, and you, your cholesterol's fine, then, you know, all that is, is just let's get your inflammation down. Because if you're, and you're, if you're having inflammation, it's inflaming blood vessels of your heart as well. And so that's the reason. It's not to shame anyone. It's just to get people to a point where uh, their body functions in the way that it's supposed to function. And, not, and there's no number attached to that. There's no weight attached to that. For every single person, it's different. But it's important to pay attention to those things. And so, you know, um, if there are so any that's questions, please make sure you type them in the chat, but I wanted you to go back to the BMI and explaining mm -hmm. that. Okay. So what the BMI is, is it is a, a number created from an equation that, that essentially um, creates a relationship between your weight and the mass of your body, the actual square inches, square, you know, so how tall you are, your shape and your weight are all combined in a way to give a number that kind of tells us where you are on a scale. Now, there have been studies that have shown that the higher that number, the more disease you see. And, the, and if the number's too low, you see different types of diseases. However, it's a number that doesn't work as well for us simply because we tend to be more muscular. And the more muscular you are, the higher your BMI. 
And so even though my weight is low, my BMI is actually higher than what you'd expect simply because I have a lot of muscle. That's genetically, we just have muscle. And so using that number isn't always a good idea for us. It can be used actually um, to discriminate in a lot of ways. And so what else ends up happening, you go to a doctor, your knees are hurting, you have a headache or you're tired or something else. They look at your BMI, they say, okay, lose weight and all those symptoms will go away. Well, some might, but that's not the reason. You can't use the BMI to decide what someone should or should not do. And that's why I don't like to use it as much just because um, it, it doesn't work for all of us. However, a guide. Your, your symptoms will, will be your guide. Oh. And, and so what's really important, though, is if this is what I see a lot and used to see a lot. People would come to me and they'd want a pill to lose weight. And there are pills that will make you not eat. But any of us who've been overweight, no, we don't eat that much. It doesn't take a lot of food to keep your weight. I was never a big eater. I never, my, my weight was not because I overate. It was usually, it was because of stress and what my body did with food when I ate it. And, the, and my diabetes, it was what my body did with food when I ate it. And so dropping my appetite wouldn't do a whole lot of anything. But rather than take a pill to drop your appetite, why not take a pill to reverse your diabetes or to get your blood pressure under control? Um, or rather than take a pill, if someone recommends, ooh, excuse me, I thought I turned my ringer off of my phone. I apologize. Um, <laughs> uh, instead of, you know, taking a pill or, you know, maybe take a yoga class, mm -hmm. learn meditation. But in the, the meantime, in the meantime, get your numbers to normal and then use something else to take over over time. Don't let your body continue to get damaged while you're working on getting those things fixed because it can take some time. And during that time, your body's still suffering from the consequences of those uh, events. Yeah, definitely. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat. But um, that is so, it's, what she's doing is so helpful to so many people because like she said, doctors do not have time none of these healthcare systems that anyone works for gives you more than like 10 minutes with a patient, if that long. So you don't have time to find out exactly what is going on and what is the underlying problem. Cause there's a whole lot of obese people that think I just like food. No, that's really yeah. probably not, not it, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, and then, you know, we do need food to survive. This is so true, but yes, you need to make better choices with your food. Someone said, is a continuously rising CRP level dangerous? Okay. First, let me ask you, what do you mean by CRP? Because in medicine, there's lots of different acronyms for things. So before okay, I answer, I want to know what you, what you say CRP is. Someone said, is there a quick change that can be made that isn't medication? Yes. You're yes. Right. There's lots of changes, actually. One is self-care. Boundary. Do you be honest? The, one of the best ways of losing weight is setting boundaries, sounding boundaries for other people, setting boundaries for yourself, setting boundaries, because the, 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 the easier you say no, the better you feel, the less your time is taken up by things that do not serve you. Just learning how to serve yourself really is the, no, is the first thing, is the easiest thing to do. So I hear like, like some people will say, how do I stop stress eating? Get and they're like, I stress eat. And I always say, don't. Well, how do I stop emotional eating? Don't. We all eat out of emotion. We, we eat to celebrate. We eat. What's Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving meal is all an emotional eating day, <laughs> you know? And so what I always say is don't worry about why you're eating. Just change what you're eating. Why do I go through that whole thing? And now you can delve into that if it's a serious problem. If you're binge eating or if you're not eating, becoming anorexic, of course, those relationships to food have to be treated and have to be investigated. But for the most part, you, the easiest way is to keep foods around you that are healthier to eat. Keep environments around you that are healthier to live and keep events around you that don't stress your body and your mind. 
That's the easiest thing to do. Okay, so she and said that's... reactive protein. Okay, yes. Um, I just wanted to be sure because, yeah, yeah CRP is, is, and that is the, the medical acronym that we use. Right. I just wanted to be sure that's what you meant. So CRP, C-reactive protein is basically what our body does when it's under stress. It's, what, it's, a, it's a protein our body puts out in stressful situations. It's nonspecific, but anytime there's any derangement of any process in our body, any inflammatory process, then it rises. Stress will make it go up. Um, dehydration will make it go up. Blood clots will make it go up. Hypertension will make it go up. And so um, if they're continuously rising levels, it's in and of itself, the CRP is not dangerous. It's the cause of it rising that can be dangerous. And so finding the cause. And so eliminating sugar, because sugar is one of those things that can cause inflammation that can make it go up. Reducing stress. Stress is something that makes cortisol go up. Cortisol can make it make CRP go up. Making sure all your numbers are normal. If you're even mildly diabetic, get treated, get your numbers down to normal, and then do what you have to to keep them there. You know, if um, your thyroid isn't functioning properly, get it treated so that your numbers go to normal because anything outside of normal, your body's going to be under stress because your thyroid helps us stay, you know, it helps our metabolism. And so um, it's really just finding all the things that stress you physically, mentally, and emotionally and try to eliminate them. So another question we have the doctor tells you that you have pre-diabetes. How do you change your diet? What do you eliminate? What do you eat? Okay. The way you change your diet is by upping your protein first. That's the easiest thing to do. When you tell people drop your carbs, carbs are comfort food. It's hard to do, but it's easier to add protein to what you're doing. So the way, what I did, because I, I, I okay, do what I say, not what I do. So <laughs> I like carbs. And so what I learned, actually, one of the things I learned when kind of putting together my program for myself was that I didn't have to reduce my carbs so much if I increased my healthy fats and my protein. And so the, the best thing to do is make sure you have protein in every meal and snack, because that way it takes up the space that would that carbs would have been in. Because prediabetes is carbohydrates. I mean, it's caused worsened by by carbohydrates. Now, depending on where you're, you are, if you're pre-diabetic, more than likely you're walking around really tired, you're walking around with mood swings, you're walking around with your weight going up, and no matter what you do, it just won't come back down, you're walking around irritable a lot of times, or just, un just feeling sluggish, feeling like you're not yourself. So my advice has always been, depending on where your level is, I treat during what is called pre-diabetes because when someone says I'm trying to get healthy, I'm trying to lose weight, I'm trying to get my health together, trying to do that when pre-diabetic without all the tools to, is like building a house and being told you have to build a house, but I'm not you can't use a hammer or you you're it's like pushing a boulder up a hill all the time and then just hoping it doesn't slip and roll over you. So what I always say is get treated because then it makes all the other behaviors that you need to do to get it to go away suddenly become whole, a whole lot easier and you're more likely to reverse it. So better to go on medication temporarily and reverse it completely for the rest of your life or constantly struggle and never get, get there. But for some people, they can. Now they can. And, and you know, even... You know, my father, who, um, who, and, and I'm very proud of this. Well, he, he was from a very large family. He was the only male in his family to live past 60. Mm. High hypertension, high blood pressure uh, in their family, very, very rampant. We're from a family that if we take care of ourselves, we do well. If we don't take care of ourselves, we do very poorly. My mother married him and said she didn't want to be a young widow. So she slowly changed his habits and he, he was actually on insulin at one point for diabetes. By the time he passed away, when he was 90, he was on half a pill when he needed it. Hmm. And that was simply from 
shifting from a high carbohydrate diet to a healthy protein, healthy fat diet, and plant-based. Um, really, if you really, really, really want to just change your diet and change your health right now, when you look at your plate, half of it should be vegetables. The amount of carbohydrates should be no more than the palm size of your hand. And the size of the protein on that plate should be the size of your hand or larger. So it's always more than that carbohydrate. And in that combination, the carbohydrate will always be the least amount on your plate. And that will get you started. So we have another question. I need to build muscle to support my bones and to burn fat. Is there a dietary change I need to make to support this? Increase protein. You be, when, when you don't eat enough protein, your body goes after your protein. I mean, goes after your muscle for that protein. So there's three things. So basically, there's three three nutrients. There's mac, what are called macro, macronutrients. You've got your protein, you've got your fat, and you've got your carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates are hard because your brain is your brain's drug. And when people say they're addicted, it's for real. Mm -hmm. It's true. Your brain just, you, you're, it's, it's our brain's crack. I mean, it really is. And so as soon as we put it in our mouths, our brain gets ready for it. It's like, all right, here comes my drug. So eating protein and more protein first breaks that pattern. And so when you eat protein, um, your body will take that protein and make muscle out of it. If you eat carbohydrates, it will take it and either turn it into fuel or turn it into fat. And if you eat um, fat, your body actually turns fat, depending on the type, turns it into hormones. So fat doesn't make you as fat as carbohydrates will. And so if you want to maintain your muscle and you don't want your body going after your muscle for the protein it needs, eat more. Most of us don't eat enough protein. And so sometimes you have to supplement it with like protein shakes as well, because we just don't eat enough to get all the protein we need. However, there are some very packed foods that are packed with protein the small beans are packed with protein. Soy is packed with protein, but you got to be careful with soy because of the estrogen. But that's still, most people don't eat enough for it to be an issue. Um, red meats are probably the least healthy source of protein. And um, however, you know, they can be helpful if, um, you know, it just depends on, on, um, it really just depends on your diet and where you live and where you're from and what kind of food you like to eat, because that's also very important. Changing your diet shouldn't mean changing your favorites or changing right. your preferences. Right. It just means upping the things that are healthy and decreasing the things that are. not Yeah. That's why it's a lifestyle. It's not a diet. It's a lifestyle mm -hmm. so that you can actually live like that. Cause that's what scared me with the elimination diet I did was that I cannot live like this. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I can't live without carbs. No. Although no. I did make it a whole two months without them. I couldn't. I'm like, I can't really. Really? Oof. I, know. I can't even make it half a day. <laughs> I, know. I, I was impressed. I like went cold turkey and I couldn't eat it. I was really wow. impressed with myself. I will yeah. never do it again. But, <laughs> but um, and I mean, I, I was the person. I went to dinner and they mm -hmm. ate and I didn't. And yeah. never will Wildfire that day decide to introduce. They had little cornbread muffins. I was like, oh. mm -hmm. And I sat there and watched. And I didn't eat a yeah. thing. And they're, they're really trip. There, there are certain rules that I stick to uh, that just make it easy so I don't have to think about it. Right. You know, it's like I, I just never eat a carb by itself. And so anytime I pick up a carb, my first thought is, what can I put with this to make it so that it's the least amount of what I'm eating? So, you know, if... Good example. And again, do what I say, not what I do. But anyway, I wanted something sweet today. So, and I, so I got an apple pie, those little packet pies, you know, mm -hmm. little. and I was like, I wanted it and I wanted it right then. But I was like, no, I was out and I was on my way home because I was grocery shopping. I went by and I saw this little pie and I was like, Ooh, I want one. And I got it. But what I did is I came home. I drank, drank a protein shake. I took some uh, lunch meat which I eat limitedly because of the salt, rolled it around some cheese, ate that, and then I had my apple pie. And then 45 minutes later, I checked my blood sugar just to be sure that it didn't go up, and it didn't. And so I'm like, okay, now I know how I can eat apple pie without it causing me a problem. 
And that's, that's big. and so now that pie, because I ate it and I enjoyed it and I savored every bite of it, none of my stress hormones came out to turn it into fat. Because that's what happens when you stress eat. And so eating when you're intentional, it doesn't have to just be what you eat, but also just sitting down, really letting all your senses take in the food so that your so brain gets the message. So not eating in front of the TV and not yeah, eating Yeah, so your run. brain, get, exactly. Your brain gets the message. It smells it. It tastes it. It hears it. It feels it. And so your brain's like, okay, food is there. And so all those hormones that tell your body you've eaten, that you're full, that you can stop now, get activated. But if you're distracted, your brain's getting mixed messages, not knowing which way to go. Should it get you ready to run because you're moving? Or should it get you ready to, you know, turn this into fuel because, you know, you need it? Should it? So it just confuses your brain when you're doing too many things while you're eating. No, I will get off the phone so that I can eat and enjoy my food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I can't talk if yeah. I, I need to enjoy every bite of this. And I in, intermittent fast, so I haven't eaten today. So when mm -hmm. I go eat, oh, I'm good for you because I can't out. do that either. Huh? You couldn't do intermittent fasting? I like you know, food too much. I've been doing it for so long. It's not a big deal. It doesn't bother mm -hmm. me. I don't miss food during the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just eat like once I start, I don't stop until literally my head hits the pillow. I eat in bed. <laughs> I tell everyone, See, I, I that's that's a pattern no, for no me that I that would be so unnatural I couldn't do it. So I just I just wake up and eat and then eat all day till my head hits the pillow. Yeah, I <laughs> I wake up and I work out. That's like the biggest thing. I have to wake up and work out. But I, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, folks are like, you eat in bed? I was like, yep, mm -hmm. I have my bowl of oatmeal. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have my golden grams. And they're like, are mm -hmm. you serious? I was like, yeah. And the other night I had a bagel, a toasted bagel, mm -hmm. and with some butter. And girl, I was, I was happy as a lamb. I'm like, yeah. Now, see, with that, if I had a toasted bagel, what I would do is put nut butter on it. And then, and or have some cheese and lunch meat with it. Because for me, eating a toasted bagel, my blood sugar would just go shoo, okay. right up. Okay. But before we go on, I just realized that I, I was reading the comments yeah. and not reading the names. And I just want to say hello to my niece who's, who asked a question, and I didn't even realize it was her who asked oh. it. Hey, Farah, how are you? I love it. I love it. I love it. And if yeah. any of the Spartans are watching, it's two of us. We are both Spartans. And yes. um, thank you, because I posted it in our Spartan group. So oh, okay. I know several of them were very interested in this conversation. And um, maybe mm -hmm. you'll get some Spartan clients. But thank you. So um, someone said, I do intermittent fast. It really helps me keep my weight under control. Lillian, mm -hmm. see, I'm with you. Yeah. No, it works. And now oh, it's, yeah. I'm not saying it, it does work, oh, no. because yeah, what it does, it affects that. You gotta yeah, that it affects that cortisol, insulin, you know, hormonal arc, especially if you're going through menopause or getting close to menopause, it really works very, very well. I personally don't have the discipline for it, right. but other people, if you do, that's good, but I, I don't. And then I keep telling everyone, when you feel like you're hungry, drink water. And then you might yeah. realize I really wasn't hungry. You just were thirsty. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the things I always recommend to anyone anyway, is always drink water before you put anything else in your mouth. Because a lot of times your body misinterprets dehydration as hunger. And so you reach for something to eat when really what your body wants is, is, is fluids. Yeah. But this has been so enlightening. And I think that, and I know a couple people have said that this was great information. So I am so glad that we did this. Thank you, everyone that watched. And then I know several people said they shared. Please, when you're watching the replay, feel free to keep sharing it because this is great information. Here's her website, drtumor.com. Please, um, can you let people know how they can find you on social media? You can find me on social media at uh, on Facebook, uh, C. Harmon Tumor MD, and which I'm the only Catherine Harmon Tumor MD on Google. So if you put if you put that in, you'll find me. But um, drtumor.com kind of gives you all the places. It's all in oh, one perfect. spot. So you can find me from there. But can I just say one thing, just yeah, because I know we were talking about heart health and weight loss. What um, I wanted to say very clearly is if you have hypertension, if you have diabetes, if you have high cholesterol, that is a deadly combination. So do whatever you have to do to 
get those under control simply because they affect the blood vessels to your heart more than any, well, they just do those three more than anything else. And so, um, and I always say blood sugar makes the inside of your blood vessels rough. Cholesterol likes to stick to it, to block it. And then what blood pressure does, if you think about how pressure washing can strip paint off the side of a house, that's what it's doing to the inside of your vessels. So get your blood pressure down, get your sugars under control, get your cholesterol under control, and protect your heart. Protect everything, your eyes, your heart, your liver, kidneys, and everything. But since this is heart month and I'm wearing my red, I just, Are I wanted to just too? reiterate that. Yes, I am. I am a Delta. Yes. That too. So Deltas, listen, <laughs> one of your own. She's trying to help you out. And anyone in the Divine Nine, we really need to touch everyone because mm. I know everybody knows somebody who is on the verge of, or they're already on heart on blood pressure medication, or they're already mm -hmm. on diabetes medication, because that's just the way it is in our community. So, and that's fine. There's right. nothing wrong with that. But it's no, there's no shame sure in that. We're doing what we can, because mm -hmm. we're losing people way too early. I'm hearing about Much heart attacks early. way too young. Much we too young. We have to do what we can do, because a lot of these, yes. you know, cancer. Unfortunately, most cancers, we can't do anything about it. It just mm -hmm. came. You know, breast cancer mm -hmm. is not like there was something she could do. No, it just came. But yeah. this is something you can do something about. You can ha mm -hmm. you can prevent this from happening to you, and prevent your children from having to bury you early. So please, let's let's mm -hmm. do what we can. Yes, and I just would like to say also, I am a community health and phys uh, family medicine physician, and I know that working with me one on one can be um, beneficial for a lot of people, but also can be out of the cost. Can not, it's, it's not always cost effective for most people. And so I do have other options like group programs, uh, just because I, I just don't like saying, telling people no, if they need help, exactly. I just can't do it. I can't That's do it. Spartan in so. Her Spartans, will. So we, Spartans <laughs> will help people. So, yes. So if I can't help you, I will find someone who can. See? So everyone, please, like I said, share, 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 share. And I will see you guys again next week at 6 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock Central, and 3 o'clock Pacific. Thanks again. Bye. Happy Valentine's Bye. Day, everyone.